Welcome to the Restitute Orbis channel, and today we're going to consider the perplexing example of the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, a 1,000 year time period in our history that we're told occurred from roughly 500 to 1500 as we understand the current chronology. We won't consider the other chronologies as we don't want to confuse this. We're looking to explain this because of the fact that we believe that our reset date occurred from 1750 to 1850. So where does the Middle Ages fit in? Where does this castle that's actually the former state capital of Louisiana fit into this? Yes, many wonderful romantic castles that appear across the landscape to include in the New World where there shouldn't be any castles. The Middle Ages, it inspires us with its tales of chivalry and romantic and courtly love. And yet at the same time, there are conflicting accounts of ruthless campaigns and we're told about how life was terrifying for 98% of the population or the peasantry. And yet at the same time, despite these many different accounts of terror mixed with romantic chivalry, we have a odd fixation with the Middle Ages. It continues in our society to this day and we see many examples of it in our fantasy literature. Today we're going to posit some theories in terms of where the Middle Ages actually falls in our alternative history timeline. Now once more I must ride with my knights to defend what was and the dream of what could be. Officially, the Middle Ages are the period in European history traditionally dated from the fall of the Roman Empire to the dawn of the Renaissance. In the 5th century, the Western Roman Empire endured declines in population, economic vitality, and the size and prominence of cities. It was also greatly affected by a dramatic migration of peoples that began in the 3rd century. In the 5th century, these people, often called barbarians, carved new kingdoms out of the decrepit Western Empire. Over the next several centuries, these kingdoms oversaw the gradual amalgamation of barbarian, Christian, and Roman cultural and political traditions. The longest lasting of these kingdoms, that of the Franks, laid the foundation for later European states. It also produced Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, the greatest ruler of the Middle Ages whose reign was a model for centuries to come. The collapse of Charles the Great's empire and a fresh wave of invasions led to the restructuring of medieval society. The 11th to 13th centuries marked the high point of medieval civilization. The church underwent reform that strengthened the place of the pope and the church in society, but led to clashes between the pope and emperor. Population growth, the flourishing of towns and farms, the emergence of merchant classes, and the development of governmental bureaucracies were part of cultural and economic revival during this period. Meanwhile, Thousands of knights followed the call of the church to join the Crusades. Medieval civilization reached its apex in the 13th century with the emergence of Gothic architecture. From nowhere, really. The appearance of new religious orders and the expansion of learning in the university. The church dominated intellectual life, producing the scholasticism of St. Thomas Aquinas. The decline of the Middle Ages resulted from the breakdown of medieval national governments, the great papal schism, the critique of medieval theology and philosophy, and economic and population collapse brought on by famine and disease. So that's the official account of the Middle Ages, but what can we really say about it when we step back and look at it more holistically? I'll admit that when I was a professor and I was teaching lesson plans on the Middle Ages, I was always very perplexed at the mix of incredible architecture and the various explanations that we have for this supposed revival of learning and understanding during a time that were originally called the Dark Ages. We have certain leaders, such as Otto the Great pictured here, who followed Charles the Great, and Otto the Great was the Eastern Carolingian Emperor, who eventually became the Holy Roman Emperor and defeated the Magyars in the Battle of Lechfeld. We also have numerous examples of incredible architectural achievements that we're told are Gothic architecture. Although the foundation of Gothic architecture is quite intriguing, and we've considered it many times in our previous explorations, it seems to lack fundamental explanation. And there are many things that if you really step back and look at it holistically, lack fundamental explanation behind the Middle Ages. For example, how is there an actual coherent recording of history when we have all these divergent sources? The official explanation will be given is it was simply the church. The church had their centers of learning, they had their isolated monasteries, and we even have accounts that many of these isolated monasteries actually preserved the civilization that was left over from the Roman Empire and the great time of learning from antiquity, that much longer period of time that preceded the Middle Ages, at least according to official history. The odd thing about the Middle Ages, though, is that with these conflicting accounts and these different governments and these different societies and all these what would appear to be apocalyptic events, and if you think about it, that's what the Middle Ages really represents, apocalyptic events. You had the rapid collapse of the Roman Empire, the final collapse of it, 
you had the destruction of many other numerous governments and many lives that were lost. And indeed, during the Middle Ages, we currently agree is the worst year in history, 536, for a variety of reasons. And you can find many videos on that. Yet somehow, we're supposed to believe that with this, and then the subsequent bubonic plague, or the Black Death that occurred, which wiped out over half the population of Europe, somehow the society managed to survive. Somehow, learning continued to endure. And somehow, Heath Ledger was in a movie about the Middle Ages, where you got to hear many contemporaneous songs. And yet, I still enjoyed that movie much more than the 2000's Robin Hood series on BBC. But I digress. So what's really conflicting about the Middle Ages? Well, you have to consider that you have all these different smaller nations and kingdoms that came out of the Carolingian Empire. The Western Carolingian Empire, which would eventually become France, and the Eastern Carolingian Empire, which over a long enough timeline would become Germany, albeit with very different developmental phases to both of them. And an odd fixation on centralization that seemed to occur. You also had these villages, the whole concept of feudalism, and peasants being associated with the land. And, of course, there was innumerable conflicts. As always, conflicts, which accompany everything. Yet, despite all these difficulties, and one of the things that we don't consider about the Middle Ages, and I can't tell you how many college professors I've heard will tell you, it just simply stank. Yes, it really smelled badly, because things weren't in a very state of sanitary conditions. The once great sanitary conditions that were present with the Roman Empire, with their sewers and their baths, were no longer present. You didn't have people that were bathing for a long period of time. You have this very divergent authority with the Pope and the influence of the Church, and yet, at the same time, you have accounts of emperors such as Otto the Great, who were conducting what was called investiture. At the same time, there were invasions that were always coming from the east, and that seems to be a recurring theme in the Middle Ages. All these terrifying invasions that were coming from the east, the Magyars, the Mongols, whoever. There was also the rise of Islam at that time, when Islam conquered all of northern Africa and even threatened Europe itself. And yet, once again, somehow, the Franks managed to stand off these invasions in the Battle of Tours, even though it seemed like there was no way they'd be able to do it. So these are just all the official accounts that we have of the Middle Ages, and if you actually try to question anything, things become problematic. Here's an example. The author of La Morte de Arthur, or the Arthurian Tales, Thomas Mallory. We don't even know the historiosity behind him. They can't identify him. You see television shows such as Robin Hood from the 2000s, where you're almost expecting Robin Hood to whip out a cell phone to call Marion. If you haven't figured it out, I wasn't exactly a fan of this show. And then, of course, you go all the way back to the beginning of the Middle Ages with the depictions of Byzantium and the supposed rise of civilization. Here, you have Emperor Justinian pictured, and to his left is the great General Belisarius. Now, could it be possible that these individuals, whether we're talking about Belisarius or Otto, actually reflected real historical individuals? Where did the Middle Ages actually fall in our understanding of our alternative history timeline? Because we believe that a reset occurred from 1750 to 1850, according to our current Five Eras timeline. And yet at the same time, we have this very well-developed history of the Middle Ages. Even though if you actually think about it and analyze it objectively, it should be very conflicted. In other words, it should be very difficult to figure out exactly what happened. Because if every single kingdom was keeping its own historical account, then shouldn't it conflict with the other kingdoms? And then you have this problem of the Florence Cathedral in what is today Florence, Italy, which today still has the largest stone or brick-constructed dome. It's funny to me that they say it's all brick. In the world, yes, in the world, there is nothing that exceeds this wonderful architectural achievement. And it should be noted that this was not completed during the Renaissance. This was done during the tail end of the Middle Ages. And yet they try to tell us that this dome was what started the Renaissance for reasons unknown. And yet at the same time, we can find many other conflicting accounts of the actual history of the Middle Ages. But we have to look a little bit more closely at what remains, in addition to the buildings, to understand what was really going on. And I think that involves looking at the art of the Middle Ages. What do we have here? A couple of knights dueling and then a couple of horses hugging each other? There's a lot of bizarre artistic impressions from the Middle Ages, and of course the first question we have to ask, as these are just images, did these images really originate from the Middle Ages? Because they give us a variety of conflicting accounts, and it's very odd when we're told that the church had a lot of power, even with the schisms, and of course we also have conflicts in that. 
For example, we're supposed to understand and accept that the Albigist, Albigensians, the Gnostics in southern France, were completely crushed and destroyed by the Catholic Church. But yet at the same time, Lutheranism managed to rise and develop on its own because, for whatever reason, its beliefs were more palpable and the Catholic Church couldn't put them down for whatever reason. In many of these works of art, though, you have strange things, hybrid creatures, odd chimeras depicted in many different ways. And it gives you the account that there's something else going on. Of course, we'll simply be told that this was merely the wild imagination at the time of a scared population. But who was really doing artwork like that at the time? Random chroniclers? Random people who were just trying to survive at the time? The interesting thing is when you look at the other civilizations that were around across the land at the same time, you also have this odd series of accounts where there appears to be this overall theme of apocalyptic doom and destruction that wasn't just afflicting Europe, but the rest of the land as well. There seem to be odd changes within the land and the very nature of the land. There also seem to be a variety of threats. And yet to this day, we have many conflicting accounts with the Middle Ages, such as the depiction of dragons. Now, of course, this would just simply be seen as a fantasy element or the wild imaginations of the people at the time. Again, imaginations of people who were very suppressed and were told that they had to believe a very specific way. And if they didn't believe a very specific way, then they were killed. It was rather simple. And we're told about the various manners in which the church had in enforcing its will and its desire for people to believe. You either believed or you died. And yet at the same time, there were people who were allowed to think differently. There were the rise of alternative religions, and this all did occur in the official account. And again, this wasn't just in Europe. There were schisms in the other major religions of the world at that time. So what to really make of it? It's really just difficult to ascertain exactly what was going on because we do not have a reliable historical account. And I think that's one of the hardest things for us to truly grasp. And a lot of people have to have something to grasp as a reliable historical account. They need to have the actual history. And this is where you find the difficulty in understanding history because there's a concept in history called historical revisionism. And I've lampooned it a couple times in the past because it oftentimes feels like you're just being picked up by your feet, swung around the room, and then dropped off at a different place. And you're not exactly sure what to make of things. And yet, this is exactly how the mainstream regards the history. For example, are these images that you're looking at right now, are these actual works of art from the Middle Ages? Or are these works of art that were produced subsequent to the Middle Ages. Because the odd thing is a lot of people often thought that the Middle Ages would go all the way up to the 1700s. You know, it was just a perception that people had. And yet at the same time, you do see a great variance in the works of art, the scope and the imagination. Now oftentimes the explanation will be, well this was just the Renaissance, there were many polymaths that were suddenly born out of nowhere and they decided to start studying the forbidden texts of Greco-Roman history and looking into their society or the writings of antiquity. Which if you ever watch the film or read the book The Name of the Rose, you'll see that those works were considered forbidden because they represented a time of civilization before the civilizing facets of Christ and all the prophets that subsequently succeeded him. It's really odd, though, when you consider some of the other aspects of the Middle Ages, because they want you to believe that they had a very definitive system of learning, that there was an explanation for how they were able to construct these incredible cathedrals of this wondrous Gothic architectural style. What's going on here is this lady taking her giant Komodo dragon for a walk and it ate somebody and the local guards had to kill it. You have many strange depictions, though, in artwork of the Middle Ages, and some of my earlier explorations involved looking at them and analyzing them. And yet you see a vast variety of creatures and odd demi-humans that are depicted in many of these works of art. What do these represent? Are these what the people really saw at the time, or is there something else going on? You even have many depictions of great epic battles of men against snails. Not exactly sure what was going on. Did we have a great snail invasion or did that represent something else? And I'm not being facetious at all. These are the kind of things that you'll see in many of these supposed works of art that supposedly originated from what we think of as the Middle Ages. So you take it all in totality. You look at the official history that we have of the Middle Ages. You have all these importance of apocalyptic doom, especially with the bubonic plague, which reduced the population of Europe by 50%, and do not ask how the society managed to survive that. Don't consider it. It just happened, and you're just supposed to take it without even asking any questions. 
Indeed, they've even gone so far now as to tell us that during the Middle Ages, even though we're told that Columbus had the revolutionary idea that the Earth was round, they try to tell us in these chronicles that they all knew and believed that the Earth was round. Quite interesting. Round or spherical. I mean, it's funny how those two seem to be confused, and there's even a play on that in the name on this channel. Yet you have stunning and stellar works of detailed art and sculpture, which, if they were carved, would take a lot of time. You also have unrelenting, unique, artistic depictions that almost show a very different people than we'd expect to see. And we have that account where the people of the Middle Ages were very worn down, that they were sick, and yet at the same time, we have other depictions that show people being very healthy and very, almost dare I say, superhuman in many different ways. Here in this depiction of Joan of Arc and the historical figure who led the French armies in a great victory in the Hundred Years' War over England and finally forced England to withdraw from northern France. Although there's conflicting historical accounts that say that Joan of Arc was merely a standard bearer. Of course, you shouldn't let that be held against anybody because a standard bearer will win you the Medal of Honor, such as Arthur MacArthur in the Civil War, at least so we're told. The really unique thing, though, is how many different depictions that you have of artwork from the Middle Ages. And you have to look beyond Europe and see some of the depictions that came from the Byzantine Empire, as they called it, although they considered themselves the Eastern Roman Empire. Although one of the questions I always ask that got myself in trouble with many of my department chairs is, how exactly do we know that they called themselves or considered themselves the Eastern Roman Empire? Of course, they use the term Byzantium or the Byzantine Empire, and what does that really reflect? Many odd concepts also reflected in the spiritual depictions of the Middle Ages, and sometimes people will say that these depict something else, greater technology or some sign of spiritualism that's depicted in this artwork. What do you make of this? What do you make of all these conflicting and yet very imaginative depictions? During a time when we're told that imagination was not something that was encouraged, that you either believed or you died. We've all heard of the Inquisition. And yet at the same time, we see these wonderful mosaics, such as of Empress Theodora from the Byzantine Empire, the real power behind the throne, the real will that was behind Emperor Justinian and his desire to reconquer many lost lands in Western Europe. And then you also have these other interesting accounts that supposedly show the piety of religion, and yet at the same time, it almost looks like we have the birth of Superman being depicted here. We have no shortage of images, though, that show that there seemed to be an apocalyptic scourge that was upon the land. Many people facing terrifying situations and facing their internal fear in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Yet, you also see incredible and stunning works of art that cannot be equaled to this day, no matter how much we're reassured that we could do this with our modern machinery. And we have other reasons for why we can't replicate this. These stunning and very inspired works of art, whether it's a painting, a sculpture, or what we're told is a sculpture or a painting. Who knows what the actual means were, though, that actually produced these stunning works of art. We also have the entire concept of individuals who somehow preserve knowledge, even though we're told that that very knowledge was forbidden at the time. So, it really comes down to the fact that if you take the Middle Ages at face value, you have so many conflicting accounts and you have so many different perceptions that it really seems as though one individual simply stood up and said, this is what happened and this is what we're deciding actually happened. Because there's no way that you could have a single account from all these different monasteries, all these different individuals, and don't tell me that someone in the Catholic Church just stood up and said, yes, this is what happened from 500 to 1,000, and this is exactly what happened. It was asking questions like this and trying to deconflict this with all the conflicting accounts that we had that initially got me into a lot of trouble with my department chair because apparently these were questions that were not supposed to be asked. I mean, I thought they were very legitimate questions. And yet somehow, history continues in our fantasy depictions of history, such as the concept of dragons. And why is it that we have a strong fantasy element in what we traditionally think of as the Middle Ages? Well, let's consider that connection of fantasy. Most of us had our introduction to the Middle Ages, or what we think of as the medieval times, through the concept of fantasy. And indeed, there is a very strong fantasy element in the Middle Ages that persists to this day. 
starting with the depiction of the numerous great creatures or dragons. Now, of course, we're told and assured by our mainstream history that there was no such thing as dragons that existed during that 1,000-year period of the Middle Ages. It was simply the fear of the people at the time. And yet, at the same time, the romantic notions of the imagination of the Middle Ages made its way into our fantasy literature that's endured from what we're told the 1800s until the present. Whether you're looking at the Game of Thrones franchise, the Lord of the Rings universe, or many, many others, He-Man, Conan the Barbarian, there's too many to list, that have the actual existence and some of the nuances of the Middle Ages, such as knights fighting dragons or knights fighting each other, or warriors of barbarians fighting each other, or some sort of civilization that existed at the time. And yet there are fantasy elements that existed in it. The presence of dragons, the presence of magic. And yet that's explained, again by the mainstream account, by telling us that there was an obsession with alchemy at the time. And it was merely the existence of alchemists and the misinterpretation or understanding of their purpose and role in society that we began to see them as what we'll think of as wizards in this fantasy world. And yet at the same time, I always find it fascinating that in these fantasy worlds you see stunning examples of architecture. And oftentimes, the stunning examples of architecture barely match or do not match what we have in reality. Many of the castles that still stand to this day, or Florence Cathedral, which you can go visit, and you can see exactly the examples of what the people were able to achieve in reality that still stand to this day. Again, if we take the mainstream account at face value. Yet all these accounts and all these legends and artistic depictions of dragons, whether it's in our current fantasy literature or whether we're actually looking at works of art that supposedly originated from the Middle Ages. And the whole concept of just having a pretty fantasy castle that's on a ridgeline or in an isolated beautiful area. But yet at the same time we're told that that's not the reality. The people lived in squalid conditions. The peasants were essentially in a post-apocalyptic state. So what's reality? Was there really a time where there could have actually been dragons and these wondrous kingdoms that existed? Where we had strange creatures that roamed the land? Is that, is that really what was being depicted in these works of art from the Middle Ages? So many different questions, and yet oftentimes we're just simply dismissed when we ask these questions, and we're told that these were a frightened people. These were people who had a very short lifespan, and there were only three classes of society in the Middle Ages. There were the knights... There were those who prayed the clergy, and there were the peasants. And those were the three main classes of society. And 98% of the people were the peasants. So, who exactly was enacting their imagination then in the Middle Ages to come up with these fantasy concepts and all these works of art that somehow endured to this day and inspired the modern fantasy literature that we still have? Game of Thrones is probably the most well-known and current contemporary example, and it's a show that's still continuing to this day. And perhaps one day the author will finish the books, but, you know, he has no commitment to do so. But you can find in what we're told are authentic works of art from the Middle Ages the depiction of all these fantastical creatures that there's no shortage of, whether it's a dragon or whether it's some sort of strange, bizarre hybrid or chimera creature, a mixture of human beings with animals. So many different strange accounts and so many odd aspects of the Middle Ages that seems to have inspired oddly enough, are modern depictions of it. I mean, if you think about the very essential roles that dragons play in the Lord of the Rings franchise and the Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire franchise, dragons are essential to both of them. Now, granted, their application and use varies quite a bit, but why are they such a prominent creature? And why do we have such a powerful depiction that somehow came about in our mainstream current fantasy literature? Was this inspired by works of art in the Middle Ages? For example, the whole concept of the wizards and wizards such as Gandalf that appear in Lord of the Rings. Are they merely the representations of alchemists? Was Gandalf simply the modern-day Merlin from an author that we can't actually pinpoint existed? There's a lot of debate about who Thomas Mallory was. Was he really some English knight who was a prisoner? Or was he someone else entirely? Or did he even exist? These are the kind of questions that you have to ask. Because when you step far enough back and you see many of the inspirations of fantasy within what we think of as Middle Ages, or should we say the inspirations of the Middle Ages in our fantasy, then we see that there is a very conflicting account here. 
we have to realize that there may be a very different explanation than what we're told as being that this 1,000 year time frame, yes, it's always a thousand years, isn't it? Occurred from 500 to 1500, or at least the time frame that we understand. And yet we can look at our great depictions of fantasy, such as in the Lord of the Rings series, where we have giant eagles fighting giant dragons. Did that really happen? Again, going back to the whole concept of dragons, the great mythical creature. And yet you can find other allusions to dragons in all of the mainstream society's historical accounts. Very strange. And you can also find the actual allusion to the existence of such fantastical creatures as being something that continues to inspire our imagination to this day. You'll continue to see films, whether they're animated, live action, or computer-generated imagery, which I think of as animation, that will continue to depict and display dragons in many different ways. And we consider the fact that these creatures in some franchises are thought of as evil, and in other franchises they're not. In the Middle Ages, it'll simply be explained as being a representation of the devil. The dragon was just that, a representation of the devil to a society that was scared and frightened. And at the same time, you can find other depictions of dragons in other societies and other civilizations where you might not think that they existed. So why are there so many consistencies then? Conflicting accounts, and yet there are consistencies that we just simply hand wave away. We have the ability to see what remains in our society, and yet at the same time, we're told to overlook it. We're told what exactly happened. Because even though Joan of Arc may have stormed a castle personally, there are other historians who were never there and never saw it who say that she was simply a standard bearer. So who exactly knows? Did some version of Joan of Arc exist in the past? I have no doubt about it. I have no doubt, though, that the story behind it may be a lot more elaborate and a lot more amazing than we'd like to believe. Because oftentimes it seems that we have these incredible tales of great heroism from the Middle Ages, and yet at the same time, they don't work their way into our modern interpretation. We're told that everyone was not really fighting for chivalry. There was no real code of honor. It's something to be disregarded. People were simply doing what was best for them. And this existence of wizards, whether it's the wondrous wizards depicted in Lord of the Rings, that's simply the product of fantasy and imagination. And alchemists, even though we say that alchemy was a proto-science, it did exist. Oddly enough, you can find depictions from Noah's Ark of dragons even being brought aboard the Ark and offloaded from the Ark. Very interesting. And so again, if we consider everything in totality, where does this Middle Ages time frame actually fall? Did this really occur before our reset time frame? It's interesting though when we try to fit it into our five eras theory where the Middle Ages may have occurred. Because we look at our five eras theory and we suspect that the reset occurred sometime from the years that we think of as 1750 to 1850. Although, remember that we don't know the actual timeline and there could be an entirely different interpretation of what the years really were. So where were the Middle Ages? Did they actually start at the beginning of our contemporary era? Is everything exactly as we're told? I always consider that possibility, although I have to admit that with continued explorations, I begin to find it less and less likely and I find that concept constantly reinforced with every exploration. Now there may be conflicting evidence, and I certainly invite you to let me know in the comments. Could the Middle Ages have actually been the beginning of the Tartarian era, or the Fourth Era? Could it have been an apocalyptic time that followed the reset of the Third Era going into the Fourth Era? I strongly consider that possibility, especially if we consider the displacement of the fact that many of the events of the Middle Ages did actually occur. Or, could they have actually been a time frame from somewhere in the Foundation eras? Possibly right after the reset of the first to the second era, or the reset of the second to the third era. Because there is a recurring theme within the Middle Ages that there seems to be an apocalyptic event that recently transpired. Now of course we'll be told it was the fall of the Roman Empire, but what if it was the fall of one of the pre-existing civilizations from the third era going into the fourth era? And I strongly suspect that's exactly what it was. The Middle Ages were the beginning of the Fourth Era, and that's why it's very confusing. It's a displaced time frame. So it did really happen, and we consider where it was in the Fourth Era. We have our three phases of the Fourth Era, the inception and rise, the ascendancy and height, and the decline and the fall. We're going to be looking at the final decline and fall soon.
But we consider that in our current theory, in this channel, that the Middle Ages was actually the start of the Fourth Era. It was that very difficult time that followed the apocalypse, or the fall, of the Third Era Civilization. And it was the attempts by what elements survived of that civilization to bring about a new civilization. Again, we see the pattern in the cycles. Now again, this is just a theory. It could be completely incorrect. And yet, we're also going to explore the concept of how what we think of as the Middle Ages managed to inspire our current fantasy literature, because we simply can't ignore that. We have many fantasy franchises that endure to this day that seem to indicate a very different origin, such as the stories of Conan the Barbarian. And we're going to explore that as well, trying to find explanations and examples and looking at the many different examples within the fundamental plots and the world building of many of these fantasy lands that we have. Or A Song of Ice and Fire. Yes, there are many connections within both of these franchises that can be drawn to what may have actually transpired. Whether we're going off with our Five Eras theory or our Multiple Realities theory. It just depends on what we want to look at. But there are far too many examples to simply ignore that these are just simply the products of imagination. Because there seems to be an odd connection between what we're told really happened and yet at the same time events that we're told are simply the product of imagination. How exactly would one know if we're just looking at written accounts? What was real and what was imagination? That's a question that oftentimes is dismissed by many people who are uncomfortable with considering the notion. But what are your thoughts? I invite you to tell me in the comments and what do you think of these theories? Well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to stay, but...